Let's uh, let's let's get started into our discussion. Um, I am really out of my element when when um, I dive, when I devolve into a lecture, and and when I don't get questions from you or I ask you questions and there's no response, it really throws me off. So, so. I, I don't know what else to tell you. When I just devolve into just telling you information, I feel like I've lost. Um, so when you're trying to understand something, if you have any question whatsoever that would lead you to a deeper understanding of that content, ask the question because everybody else will benefit from, from your question. Okay, um, we're getting down to it. A week, a week from right now, you guys will be quoting Dr. King. You'll be quoting Martin Luther King Jr. when he said, Free at last! Free at last! Thank God Almighty! I'm because the exam will be over, right? So, so you're one week away. No, we still have to show this I know I'm I'm exaggerating, but the hardest part of the hardest part of the whole year in a push will be behind you. So so you but you can't let up until then. Of course you need to sleep. You need to sleep eight hours and 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 really be good to your body for the three or four days before the test because a well rested student is far superior. To an, to an exhausted student. When, when you're sleep deprived, your mental capacity is, is far diminished. It really is, so you've got, no matter what you haven't covered or haven't done, those last few nights before the exam, if you wanna do well, you gotta, you gotta be rested. Okay, so let's get into the military industrial complex. This was a speech given by Dwight D. Eisenhower. It's actually his, his, um, his last speech before he left the presidency. I think he gave it a few nights before he, be, before he left um, the presidency. And he's got a lot of similarity to George Washington. I don't want to elevate him too high, but think of the similarities. He led the United States through World War II as one of, one of the highest profile military leaders in, in World War II. And then he's a two-term president, and he's also, you know, conservative, respected. Many people just show deference to him. He's elderly when he's the president. That's true of George Washington. And George Washington gave a farewell address, right? And so Eisenhower says, why can't I give a farewell address? And Eisenhower warns the American people about something. And so did George Washington. He warned the American people about something. So the entire speech, we've got a little time. I don't think we need to read the whole thing, but let me draw your attention to a few key parts of it. It's relatively short. My fellow Americans, three days from now, after a half century in the service of our country, I lay down the responsibilities of office in a solemn and traditional ceremony, and the authority of the presidency is gonna be vested in John F. Kennedy. And so this evening, I come to you with a message of farewell and, and, and et cetera, and share a few final thoughts. And then, you know, he's kind, I wish the new president uh, Godspeed, um, blah, blah, blah. Um, Let's go down to number three. Throughout America's adventure in free government, our basic purposes have been to keep the peace, to foster progress in human achievement, to enhance liberty, dignity, integrity among people and among nations, and to strive for less would be unworthy of a free and religious people. Any failure traceable to arrogance or lack of comprehension or readiness to sacrifice would inflict upon us grievous hurt, both at home and abroad. Okay, keep going. We face a hostile ideology. 
I'm at the top of the second page. We face a hostile ideology, global in scope, atheist in character, ruthless in purpose, insidious in method. Of course, he's referring to communism, right? Unhappily, the danger it poses promises to be of indefinite duration. To meet it successfully, there's called for not so much the emotional and transitory sacrifices, but rather those which enable us to carry for blah, blah, blah. Okay, keep going. Last paragraph before that Roman numeral number four. The record of many decades stands as proof that our people and their government have, in the main, understood these truths, responded to them well, but threats new in kind or degree constantly arise, I mentioned two only. Okay, a vital element in keeping the peace is our military establishment. Our arms must be mighty, ready for instant action, so that no potential aggressor may be tempted to risk his own destruction. Our military organization today bears little relation to that known by any of my prede predecessors in peacetime or indeed by the fighting men of World War II or Korea. Until the last of our world conflicts, the U.S. had no armaments industry. Now, that's where you got to understand what he's saying. The United States' ability to manufacture weapons has never been permanent before. We always only created them when we had a war. And then when the war ended, they stopped manufacturing weapons. But he's going to tell you now we have a permanent arms manufacturing industry. Even though we're not at war, we have a permanent <coughs> industrial uh, manufacturing of weapons. Okay? American makers of plowshares could, with time as required, make swords as well. Do you guys know that reference? Plowshares and swords? So plows are for peaceful purposes, for farming and swords, obviously. But now we can no longer risk an emergency improvisation of national defense. We've been compelled to create a permanent arms industry of vast proportions. Added to this, three and a half million men and women are directly engaged in the defense establishment. We annually spend on military security more than the net income of all US corporations. So that's a second point now. He's saying we've never had a permanent military in American history. We've allowed it, when we're not at war, to shrink back down to a, to a peacetime, minuscule level. But now we're keeping a large military force in place permanently. Okay, th th those are key points that he's going to culminate here in a second. This. If you have a copy, um, you probably see the brackets. This is the most famous part of this quote. If you get this as a document, that'll be the part that's quoted. It says, this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its, comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. Okay, this is the most famous sentence or set of sentences. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. Okay, so <clears throat> 
So a complex, what's a complex? It's a joining of two things, right? In chemistry. So what's joined together is the military establishment. The Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines. That's government. It's conjoined to the arms industry. That's corporate. See, we've never had this before, where there is a corporate interest to make money by manufacturing weapons and a government establishment that's permanent. It's funded by the government. Now, why is that dangerous? Because Eisenhower is the ultimate military man. If anybody would have known that this is dangerous, Dwight D. Eisenhower would have known. He spent most of his career in the military and eight years as president. And this troubled him. Why? What's the danger? Jasmine. Exactly. Exactly. We must guard. What's he say? In the councils of government, <coughs> we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence and the potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists. Misplaced power. So, Here's, here's really something beyond military establishment, the arms industry, and Congress. So, so now think of it as a tri-complex. They joined Congress to the complex. How did Congress get sucked into that? Corinne? Would it be to kind of judge their actions to make sure that they were doing the right Well, that would have been the good, that would have been the good result that he's saying in the councils of government we must guard against this, but that's not what happened. Oscar. With lobbyists. What do these guys need to get reelected? Support. Yeah, they need money to get reelected. Who has money? Who spends the tax money to buy the weapons? Okay, well, you may not understand how they're joined. So let's let's go deeper here. If you're a, a high up in the military, like let's suppose you're a military general. You know, you can work in the military for 20 years and then retire and take your pension. And a lot of what people do, even teachers do this, is once they get their pension, they still feel like they have some energy, and so they take their pension and they go get a different job. Well, let's suppose you were a high up in the military and you take your pension, and you're retired now, who might want to hire you? Weapon makers. Weapon makers. Why? Because you know what you need. Because you can, you, can, you can have been here and come over here, and you can make a, fo a phone call back to there and say, hey, Hal, we got this wonderful weapon. We really think you should take a look at this weapon. You didn't have to go knock on any door. You just called your friends back in, in, in the Pentagon. What about, if you, what about if you're in Congress for 20 years and then you lose your election? You still want to work. Where might you be able to go to work? Yeah, you could come over, especially if you were on the Arms uh, Select Services Committee. 
the committee that oversees military spending. Now wait, how much does the United States government spend on the military every year? <laughs> yeah, 50% of the total budget. Something like, I think this year's military budget is something like $750 billion. All right, now I'm going to use an individual person as an example, but he is just the tip of the iceberg. It's not just this person. It's not just this party. It's both parties. It's hundreds and hundreds of people who do this. Dick Cheney came to Washington, D.C. in the 1970s as a congressman from Wyoming. 1978, I think. And then he, um, I think he lost, and so he went to work for Ronald Reagan administration, and he got some experience in, in the Reagan administration. And when Reagan, um, by the time by the time George H. W. Bush, um, I'm just going to list his his uh, jobs. We're talking about Dick Cheney, the former vice president of the United States. Okay, eighty to say eighty six, he worked for um, Reagan, the Reagan White House. Okay, then for, for um, 88 to 92, he was the Secretary of Defense. Okay, you know who the Secretary of Defense is. They're the CEO of the, of the Defense Department. They oversee that $700 billion budget. Okay, and then Bush lost to Clinton in 92, so he went to work for Halliburton. Halliburton is a manufacturer of military weapons, and what he got accomplished during the Desert, de desert Storm and, and, and the Gulf War under Bush is he privatized a bunch of um, aspects of the military. So he called up the military and said, you know, you'd save a lot of money if you just contracted out for us to provide all of the meals for the military. Just as an example, or all the cleaning of military offices. Okay, so he created millions and millions of dollars profit for Halliburton Corporation. He was the CEO of Halliburton, and and for six or eight years, he made he made a lot of money because CEOs of corporations make a lot of money. Then. In, 19, uh, in, in 2000, George W. Bush um, became president, and so he becomes, uh, this is from, this would be between 1993 and 99. In 2000, he becomes vice president of the United States. Well, he, he basically went from here to here to here, he went, he went, there's a revolving door for people who work in high levels of each one of these. They, they may as well just be connected with, with uh, a sidewalk. That's, that's how easy it is to get hired from one place to another to another. Uh, Jasmine. Okay, first of all, Congress hasn't declared war since December 8, 1941. What's happened is Congress has, Congress has yielded their power to declare war by saying, you decide, Mr. President, if you think, if you think maybe we need to use the military there, you decide. Congress has defaulted on their responsibility in the Constitution Constitution gives Congress the authority to declare war. But Congress has not declared war since 1941. When we fought Korea, we fought Vietnam, we, we, we fought in Afghanistan, we fought in Iraq. Uh, there have been hundreds of military actions taken by the US military since 1941. Why is this dangerous? D 
Did the United States heed Dwight D. Eisenhower's warning? Those are two different questions. Did the United States heed Eisenhower's warning? No. No, the thing just progressed the same way that he warned it would. So why is it a danger? I think it's almost obvious, but who could state it? Oscar, why is this bad? This is bad. Because, like, you're putting the power to, like, start a world war and, like, use the atomic weapons in the hands of a few, or, like, one person. Okay, yeah, I mean, th th those, would be, those would be extreme examples, but, but essentially you're, you're, you're yielding the power to declare war to people who would make money by having the war. And Congress is no longer the one. I mean, think about that. The Constitution gives, Article Two gives Congress the power to declare war. But the United States hasn't, the Congress hasn't declared war for for a long time, but we've had a lot of war. We've had almost permanent war. This happens on a broad scale. It happens, Dick Cheney is just the tip of the iceberg. This is deep. There are thousands of people who used to work for the military, but they retired, and then they went over to work for the arms industry. There are a lot of congressmen or congressional staffers who they lost an election, and so they went over to work for the arms industry. Or there are people who were high up in the arms industry who get appointed to work <coughs> in the military as, an, as a CEO or an administrator. I think the current defense secretary, do you, do you remember just, just uh, six months ago, the secretary of defense resigned? in protest of the Trump administration. I don't know if you remember that. James Mattis, Secretary of Defense, wrote a really scathing letter of President Trump and said, I can no longer serve this man. And he walked away. Do you know who he appointed? He appointed the CEO of Boeing. So, CEO of Boeing kind of connected to aerospace industry, right? Walked over here and became the CEO of military establishment. Okay, what, what, what questions do you have? Does this raise any questions in your mind? It's kind of an explanation for why we've had so much war or why we spend $750 billion a year on the military. Because this, this sector makes a lot of money when this sector passes a, when this sector spends $750 billion, a lot of that money gets spent in these industries. And this is the one that appropriated the $750 billion to here to spend, and they spend it there. Do you see the connection? <coughs> One, one of the things I, uh, I have done in the past is on the Friday, on the day of the national exam in the afternoon, um, when sixth and seventh periods come in, I just, I just show my favorite movie clips. I, I, just, I just tee it up. And one of my favorites is from this movie called uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Have you, have you ever heard of that film? It's uh, Robert Redford and uh, Paul Newman. They're ancient actors. Actually, both still alive, I think. Do you guys even know what I'm talking about? No. Never seen Mad Men. All right, well, I'll show you that clip. Because that seems to be the response I'm getting from you guys. Is... Come on, somebody ask me a question about the military industrial complex. Um, you wish you were calling. Shreya. Why wasn't um, the military establishment as connected to the arms industry before? Okay, good. Because the arms industry was was temporary, only a phenomenon of a war period. And then when the war ended, the government said, nope, we're not going to manufacture weapons anymore. 
And so the arms industry went back to making automobiles, Fords, Chryslers, trucks. Onion? Yeah, I mean, I mean, how do you stop it? It's like the, the beast that has been created, but it's like Frankenstein. How do you, how do you kill the beast? What, what could a president do? I mean, they say nice things that this is really bad, people. But, I mean, what what solution is there? You've kind of created a Frankenstein. Did somebody else have a question? I was just going to ask if, like, if there's a way to change it or anything or, like, fix it. Um, well, here's one thing. If Congress developed a spine and decided that they were going to correct this. Congress has the power to declare war. That means they have the power to curtail the military establishment in theory, but the current partisanship has really prevented Congress from being effective in, in almost any area of the country. Yeah, Corinne? How did, they lose, how did Congress lose I don't think they lost it. They just yielded it. I think they don't want to make they don't want to make important decisions because that could keep them from getting reelected. If they make an important decision and it, and it turns unpopular, they may lose their seat in Congress, their precious seat. <clears throat> that seems to be what Congress is so inspired to do is keep their seat. But if they're not really doing anything in their seat, what's the point of having? It's a nice position. You get to smile at cameras and wave at people, and you got a, you got a really nice health care and pension package, and you get to fly to Washington, go on junkets. The only better job might be to be an ambassador.